I do want to mention that we will have a class immediately following the services for those who have been in attendance. We will be in here to watch the remainder of the video that we started concerning uh, scriptures and their formation and so forth. So this is where we will be assembling. We have been noticing on Sunday afternoon for a couple of Sundays what the Old Testament prophets had to say about the church. Much is said by them concerning Jesus Christ and even the events we've just sung about and uh, the song we just participated in, especially in Isaiah 53. But many times we don't see they had a lot to say about the church, but they did. And there's a reason for that, and I think it's found in Acts chapter 9, or at least one place it's found, where Jesus appears to Saul of Tarsus, who's been very busy and vehement and fervent in the persecution of the church. And in Acts 9 verse 4, as Jesus appears to Saul, he said to Saul, or he asked of Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? Well, Saul never saw Jesus in the sense while he was in his earthly ministry. So he could persecute him. So what does he mean, why persecutest thou me? Saul's persecuting the church. We learn from the rest of the scriptures, the church is the body of Christ. Into Christ one is baptized, having first believed in Christ, repented of sins, and confessed one's faith in Christ. That's the only doorway there is into Christ, where God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1.3 so we would do well to realize that you do not <laughs> mess with the Lord's church as it's set out in the New Testament without messing with Jesus. I say that because of the old advertisement on the bumper sticker and used in various ways some years ago, don't mess with Texas. Well, when you try to upset the church, when you attack the church, when you hurt the church, the Lord says, you're doing that to me. You're doing that to me. That ought to make members of the church more particular about their conduct in the church. The pattern of life they set before the world because that's how the world sees the church is through its members. They may never listen to a sermon. They may never attend a worship period of the church. They may never have a home Bible study with you. But they know that you say you're a member of the Church of Christ, if they know much about you at all. And thus you represent, as a member of that church, the spiritual body of Christ. So we need to think about that when we study about the prophets and the church the prophets saw. Now we looked first of all when we started this at Joel and Amos. Then last week at Isaiah and Micah together. And we saw that as we studied them, that in looking at Joel, we saw that the church would come with the great power from the Holy Spirit, which we see recorded as Peter quoted Joel, Joel 2.28 in Acts chapter 2. And then when you come to Amos, you see the prophet seeing that this is the breach broken in the division of the southern and northern kingdoms. And you see that all mended. You see the unity once again, into which also all men would be able to be unified. And the planks in God's platform for unity are set out by Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. And that's how we all become one in Christ Jesus. Then last week we noticed in looking at Micah and Isaiah together that he spoke or they spoke of the church as the family of God. The house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, as Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. Today I would like to look at the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was one of the four major prophets who wrote two of the five major prophet books. I remind you, minor prophet means a shorter book and major prophet means a longer book. I remind you also that there were no writing prophets till after the division of the kingdom. And that there are only two kinds of prophets, writing and oral prophets. 
and we can read of oral prophets, uh, what they did, what they said. But these are prophets who actually wrote down what we have, we've been studying from it. This man, Jeremiah, is from the southern kingdom, and his name means God throws. God throws. He prophesied from somewhere between 627 B.C. to around 580 B.C. Somewhere. Now, these are rough things because he was there in Jerusalem when the final siege took place and when it all fell and Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple and all of Jerusalem and the remainder of the people there were carried away into captivity in Babylon. Now, remember they'd had two preceding invasions and the first one, they carried away the royal people and the nobles and the learning people. The next, they carried away those who were tradesmen and artificers and such as that. And then they carry away whatever was left in the final destruction of Jerusalem. He was contemporary with Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Daniel, and Ezekiel. In fact, Ezekiel is doing his work over in Babylon at the time that Jeremiah is doing his work in besieged Jerusalem. And we all know him as Jeremiah the weeping prophet, weeping over what has happened to Israel. And what happened to them is exactly what God said would happen to them. You keep on going contrary to my will and not listening to me and I will destroy you. That was said before they ever got into the land of Canaan. You read Deuteronomy and you see Moses over and over and over again saying you must do what I tell you to do. That is God telling them what to do. If not, I'll treat you just like these people you're fixing to replace, the Canaanites. And of course, they didn't. And there's what happened to them. So Jeremiah's weeping about that. He's not happy about what happened. He's hurt. And yet they wouldn't pay attention to him. They rejected him. He authored two books, as you know, the one that bears his name, Jeremiah, and then the one immediately following, the Lamentations. Again, he's lamenting the state of Israel or Judah. Evidently, he authored what he did by dictating all his prophecies to what we would call a secretary. His name's mentioned in the book. His name's Baruch, B-A-R-U-C-H. And this is from the beginning of his ministry until the fourth year of King Jehoiakim. He was threatened in his own hometown, that is, the prophet was, Anatoth. He was tried for his life by the priests and prophets of Jerusalem who were false to the core. He was, in the process of their persecuting him, put in stocks. And he was forced to flee from King Jehoiakim. He was publicly humiliated by the false prophet Hananiah. And then he was thrown into a cistern in which the mud came up above his knees. And then as the thing draws to a close, he's forced to go into Egypt where he didn't want to go in the first place or the last place for that matter, and there's where we leave him. We know very little about that after him. He has been called, and rightly so, a heartbroken man with a heartbreaking message. I think a lot of times we fail to see that in those who teach the Bible to the world and those who are gospel preachers and preach the whole counsel of God. All truth is not waving flags in the 4th of July. Truth sometimes is coming to tell you the Alamo has fallen. Truth sometimes is to tell about the surrender of Bataan in World War II, which is the largest surrender of American troops in, in American history. Truth is sometimes telling about the terrible death march that they made and hundreds and thousands of them died. But truth is truth is truth and the part that tells you about the Ethiopian uh, nobleman rising up from the waters of grand, uh, baptism and going on his way rejoicing that's marvelous we're happy we see people baptized and we rejoice with them and we're seeing praises about it and rightly so but that's not all the truth to just sing about the good things the bad things play a part in it too or you wouldn't have Jeremiah and lamentations in your Old Testament. And Paul said all in the Old Testament was written a four time for our learning, Romans 15, 4. 
one of the things that seems to me that many members of the church never get worked out is simply because you have had your past sins remitted in the waters of baptism, the Lord's added you to His spiritual body, which is the church, Acts 2.47, doesn't automatically mean that from here on out everything's a bed of roses and everything will go just like you want it. There will be no terrible decisions. There will be no chances at frustration, etc., etc. It won't be. There, part of that is simply because of our lack of trust in the Word of God. Really one of the greatest comforting factors that a child of God has, and it's certainly what Jeremiah had and all the other faithful prophecies, is to know that whatever happens to you here, no matter how terrible it is, first of all, it's temporary. You only hurt so long. And even this will pass away. Well, for the faithful child of God, that's not the end of it. Then the glory begins. We sang about some of that, didn't we, just that, this afternoon? Now, what does that do? Well, it tells us about how hope saves us. Hope is that expectation of what children of God have a right to expect. And what is that? It's heaven and all that that means. But it's coupled with an earnest desire to, to possess it. You want to go to heaven. You want to be there. And so you look over all the trials and tribulations of this life to the reward that is eternal. This is just pilgrims passing through. And that's what's said about Christ concerning His terrible suffering and death on the cross on our behalf. For the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross. That ought to be our motto. It was Jeremiah. It was all the rest who were faithfully proclaiming a message that constantly got them into trouble because they had to tell the truth that wasn't pleasant for people to hear. But necessary and part of it. We should cultivate that kind of hope. Romans 8 verse 24 says we're saved by hope. You have the eye of faith. Since faith comes by hearing the word of God, you can see what's beyond the veil of death. Sufficient to strengthen you and to cause you to persevere and to keep on keeping on. Jeremiah is known then as the weeping prophet. A heartbroken prophet with a heartbreaking message. And he labored think sometimes it gets long to deal with a problem. He labored in his prophetic work for about 40 years, proclaiming a message of doom and gloom. I don't know what some of these uh, folks today who, who think that Christianity, which to them is false Christianity anyway, because they don't know really what New Testament Christianity is, but they preach everything is wealth and happiness. You become a Christian, you know, when you rise from water or whatever they consider the way you become a Christian, which is usually wrong, that immediately your bank, your bank account is going to have some way, or actually all sorts of money deposited in it. You're going to go home in a new car, and you're going to live in a million-dollar house, and you're going to own all sorts of land, and uh, your kids are always going to be successful, and they're never going to cause you any problems. Kids don't do that. Uh, everything will be wonderful. You'll never have to make any hard decisions any longer. That's the false view the devil would have false teachers teach you about service to God. And it's just not that way. God gives us the wherewithal when the word of God's properly understood to be faithful and to rejoice that our sins are forgiven and heaven is our home even when you're down in a cistern and you've preached 40 years and what have they done to you? Rejects you in every way. You can be like Christ. The pattern for us who endured the cross for the joy that was set before Him. The fact that this is the way all men can be saved. So Jeremiah labored these years working among what the Bible would call a stiff-necked people. They were not going to turn. They were not going to listen. And you say, well, why would God put him through that? It shows the love of God. And we sing about the love of God a whole lot, don't we? But the love of God says, I am going to give them everything they need, even when they're throwing it back in my face, because I want them to, I can't, to be able to say that I did all that is possible to get them to change. But they must change. They are the ones to change. I am the one to change. You are the one to change. God will not change us against our will. But He will reason with us. He'll give us His word. And Jeremiah did that, but they didn't listen. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and after, after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and write it on their hearts, or in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now this is Jeremiah by the Holy Spirit able to look many, many years down the road and see the church. And he sees the family of God, the church, as a new covenant written on the inward parts of men's hearts. You know, to become an Israelite, which he was, you had to be a fleshy descendant of Jacob through one of the twelve tribes. And you had to be instructed in the law and you had to understand, here's the way an Israelite lives. But what he's saying here that they don't understand is that all men will be instructed, not just Jews. All men will have access to the truth. That doesn't rule out each individual using the ability he had to study and learn the truth. Too much is said in the New Testament about studying the Word of God. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1.25 Or study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 but he's talking about a new covenant and a new people. And remember when you hook together all that's been said with these other prophets. The house of God, which is the church of the living God. The idea that the church would start with power of the Holy Spirit, Joel 2. The idea that oneness or unity is going to be brought back together from the division that came about in uh, Judah and Israel. The covenants were common to all men in Jeremiah's day. And God had made a covenant with the Israelites when He took them by the hand, as it were, through the prophecy, or rather should say, through the agency of Moses. And He led them out of Egypt. Now, Jeremiah was not only familiar with the existence of this covenant, but he also was very aware of the contents of that covenant. Through means of the concept of a covenant. The great prophet Jeremiah was given considerable details of the concept of a covenant. However, time and again, the Israelites broke God's covenant with them. Jeremiah lived in a day when Judah had become more evil than Israel had been prior to that nation's captivity. In fact, Judah had become more evil than Sodom and Gomorrah. And under those circumstances, the prophet Jeremiah saw a time and a people who would have God's law written in their inward parts and in their hearts. Now understand this better. I've said over and over again that where you have an Old Testament prophecy and over here in the New Testament, the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writer to give the prophecy tells us what it means, then you have an inspired divine commentary on the meaning of the Old Testament prophecy. And the Hebrews writer in the New Testament, when speaking to the point of how there had been change in the priesthood, which thing required a change in the law also, had this to say in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 10. But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Then he starts talking about the place and purpose and design of the law of Moses. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for the second. But because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord. But I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now he's quoting Jeremiah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. 
Because they did not continue in my covenant. That is, they didn't live up to the law of Moses. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. And I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now the context of Hebrews is here are Jews who had lived under that law and had approached God under the law of Moses. But when the gospel came along, they believed it and obeyed it. But they were persecuted because they were Christians. Now they're actually considering giving up the whole New Testament system and going back under the law. And the writer of Hebrews is reasoning with them. Don't you know Jeremiah? Don't you understand what he said? Don't you understand that he prophesied of this law, the perfect law of liberty, the New Testament system, the new covenant that you have understood and you believed and you've obeyed and you're a part of that system? No, they, they didn't. They didn't get it or else they were weak in the faith and they were not understanding some things. I should say to all of us removed 2,000 years from the writing of this book to those people and under their circumstances, we shouldn't be too hard on them. Because they were coming out of a situation we've never been in. And they were living under a situation we've never been in. Yet the wherewithal was there for them to understand and to know and to realize and see the fulfillment. Jeremiah saw the church in a very real sense when he saw it as a covenant written on the inward parts of man's heart. Men's hearts. There's not a more distinctive and spiritual characterization characterization of the Lord's church than the concept with which Jeremiah the prophet reflected about it or on it. So there's an inscribing of the Lord's covenant on the inward parts of man, especially on the heart. Now, that's Jeremiah. I hope that you're keeping note as I've reviewed last week and then this week as to what Joel and Amos, then Isaiah and Micah, and then Jeremiah, as you put the concepts they had together and see how they prophesied of the church that Jesus promised to build and did build, Matthew 16, 18, and Acts chapter 2. The church he purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. But leaving Jeremiah for a moment, we move over to the great prophet Daniel. Again, one of the four major prophets. A prophet of the southern kingdom. And his name means God is my judge. Now, Daniel lived a long, long time and did the work of a prophet a very long time. His work bridged the entire 70-year period of Babylonian captivity. He was deported to Babylon at the young age of 16. And while in captivity, he was hand-picked for government service. It was the custom of the great empires of that day and time when they conquered a people to take the best of the people and put them to work for them. And that's what happened. He was one of the few well-known Bible characters about whom nothing negative is ever written. You take note of that when you're reading Daniel. His life was characterized by faith, by prayer, courage, consistency, and a lack of compromise. I would say that's a good example for you and me in serving Christ in the church. He is mentioned three times by his 6th century contemporary, who is Ezekiel, as an example of righteousness. Daniel then is well known for having been put in the den of lions. That's one we learn from our youth up. Daniel in the lion's den. He was a contemporary with both the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And nine of the twelve chapters of his book center around dreams that God used to foretell many events in the future regarding the church or the kingdom. Daniel was in the process of setting forth Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the interpretation of it. When we read chapter 2 and verses 31 through 35. It says, Thou, O king, uh, you were watching. And behold, you saw a great image. 
And in this great image, whose splendor was great, it was excellent, stood before you. And the form was awesome. This image's head was made of gold, fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, which is in the King James brass, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And this is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, reminding him of the dream, and he says, You, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. And it struck the image in, in its feet, its feet of iron and clay, and it broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. It's always very interesting to me, remembering what we said at the beginning of how God took the things of that time, that culture, that period, and used it so the people would have an understanding of events to take place in the future. That's why in our proper study of the Bible today, we must study it from the standpoint of how they saw it, how they understood it, how their language represented things. It'll always be the case. So here's a small but very hard stone. That, of course, would be a very familiar object to all the people, including Daniel, also Nebuchadnezzar. And it turned out to be a very fitting object with which to convey certain characteristics relative to the church. First of all, it's cut without hands, not made by human, thereby denoting that it was no part not just no part of being made by a human, but no part of the human order of things, arrangement, or design. Now that hits denominationalism right upside of the head because they admit that uh, denominations have nothing to do with saving your soul. And that there's one church, but all the denominations make it up. And you're saved by Christ by asking Him to come into your heart. And then you select one of the denominations to be a part of because it suits you. Well, when you can find that description of the church Jesus built in the New Testament, I'll believe it. But look all you want, and you will not find it. And this one thing, this stone cut out, and this was said hundreds of years before Jesus walked this earth, without hands, says man didn't have a part in it. Man didn't have a part in it. And it's, even though very small, it also says it's very hard thereby denoting its power to break in pieces the terrible image of gold, silver, brass, and iron, which each one represent great world empires. And in short, the four great world empires or kingdoms are the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and finally the Roman empires. There's an unusual feature about this stone. It was contrary to, nation, to, to nature. It grew. And it grew. And it filled the whole earth. The stone which is the Lord's church began on the memorial day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ as recorded by Luke in Acts 2. A very small company of men and women comparable or if you compare it to the rest of the city, even for that day and time, but certainly the world. Yet eventually, in just a few hundred years, it would break the great Roman Empire, of which empire there's been no greater and probably never will be again. It did it through teaching and godly living and the blood of the martyrs. No compromise of the truth. In less than five centuries it did it, even though the church was undergoing apostasy during much of that time as far as its organization and its worship. Its morality remained pretty much the same. Christians endured ten violent persecutions over a period of three centuries besides local things. This is what we can learn from what we would call church history. Sometimes we don't realize that throughout the empire you might have somewhere in Asia 
a terrible persecution going on, but not so much in Spain. You might have some terrible persecution going on, say, in Italy, but not so much down in Israel. Or you might have something going on in Israel, and you might not have it going on in North Africa. But then sometimes they were empire-wide. But nevertheless, they didn't compromise. That is, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the only Savior of the world, and there's only one church that He built. And all men are to be added to it through obedience to the gospel. They never gave up on that that concept. And ultimately, the church conquered, not through carnal military might and military power, but through sufferings and death for the cause of Christ, the cause of righteousness. You see, we don't too many times see that today. We don't understand how I can die for something, but I win when I die. Now, I don't know why we don't. Again, I call to mind my example I've used many times at Alamo. How many of those men, after Santa Ana walked on past there after his defeat, those men that died in the Alamo, how many of them rejoiced over and knew about what all they would come by the time you got down to see the San Jacinto and remember the Alamo? They didn't. They were dead. And you can go all the way through time. Remember the 300 Spartans? And so on and so forth. But strangely, when it comes to the spiritual kingdom, when we have so much information in the Bible, we say this is God's Word. And we're just here for a short time. And here's what lies ahead forever, without end. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Romans 2.10. That means in order to die, you remain faithful even if you must suffer and die. Because you don't get your reward of eternity and glory in this life. And yet, watch it, brethren. Look how we tenaciously strive to hold on to our brief physical existence. Look at how we do it. I'm reminded... And, and nothing, I'm not against the fact that humans hold on to life. That's not the point. If you got that point, you missed the point. But I'm sort of mindful of a joke that I heard to emphasize this. Two elderly ladies were very good friends. As they got older, they became more particular than ever about their health. And they wouldn't eat this and they wouldn't eat that that and they went on these walks and they did all of this kind of thing every day and finally guess what they died they died faithful Christians and when they got into glory one looked at the other and said if I knew it was going to be this good I wouldn't have been doing all that stay down there on earth that long you see how there is an element of truth in that sometimes about how we are wedded and welded to this world? But it shouldn't be. The Bible's full of material that says they did not count their lives precious when it came to staying with the truth and wanting to go to heaven. Listen to Paul. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of life. And not to me only, but to all of them that love is appearing. That's for you and for me. Didn't mean that Paul wanted to get out of this life when there was still work to be done. I think the view that's being taught by these prophets concerning the church and the life of members in the church when the church would begin until the end of time is we use what time God gave us and we don't know when it's going to end, but we're going to use it seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. Sometimes we try to hang on with our fingernails to things that are going to pass away anyway. And we miss a whole lot of the happiness that there is in this life. Because the greatest thing about this life and the greatest happiness there is about this life is getting ready for eternal life. Now that's what makes people happy. I don't stop here. This is just passing through. This is just a brief interlude that's a flash of light. Try to picture yourself in eternity 
remembering your life on earth. And it'll just be a flash in a bucket. Or, more consistently, a flash in a pan. <laughs> or like one of these flashes of lightning. That goes by pretty fast. Are you a Christian this afternoon? We studied the beginning, what it takes to become a Christian, and more than that, God does not demand of you, but less than that, you cannot believe and obey and become a Christian. Are you a member of His church? The prophets prophesied of it. It was prophesied of, it was prepared for, and it's a reality ever since Acts 2. And the plan of salvation is plain. As a child of God, are you faithful in the church? Are you looking for heaven? Just a heartbeat away. That is the glories of eternity for the faithful child of God. Where you'll be forever. There will never be any saying, I want to go home. I'm tired. Aren't you tired of being here? And on and on we say that because of physical bodies that wear out. God never intended for us to plant ourselves here. He intended us to use it so we can go to the eternal home and never leave. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.